Hey, good morning. It's great to be with you. My name is Jeff. As Scotty said, I'm one of the pastors. I get to uh, speak today. I'm excited about it. Hey, I talked to Scotty this week. He mentioned the Christmas Eve services, and he mentioned coming on Saturday or maybe going to the Highlands Ranch site. I've talked to him, and if you come on Saturday or go to the Highlands Ranch campus, we can give you a 3% discount on tithe for January. So just <laughs> something... If you're new here, don't ever listen to me. Like, I make stuff up. But if you are new, we'd love to get to know you where there's a Connect card on the bottom of the notes when you came in. If you'd fill out as much as you're comfortable sharing with us, we would love to send you a little bit more about, um, about Journey and get connected with you. As Scotty mentioned, we have a Highlands Ranch campus. In fact, let's welcome our Highlands Ranch campus today. We are so glad that you are with us. We love Wade and Isaac, the whole team over there. We are adding, as Scotty also mentioned, a third campus in Parker. And if you live in the Parker area like I do, or you want to just hear more about our uh, locations, right after this service here at Castle Pines, if you go downstairs, there is a quick meeting, not very long. I'll tell you a little bit more about Parker. We'd love to do that. Now, I love this week. This is one of my favorite weeks of the year because we're leading up to Christmas. Any, anybody else just love kind of that anticipation of Christmas? Yeah. At Highlands Ranch, you're all loving Jesus and Christmas here, a couple of people, just two. So I love it. I love the anticipation. As I was a kid, I just building up to Christmas and thinking about what kind of toys am I going to get on Christmas? And, and on Christmas Eve, we get to open our stockings, kind of a taster for the next day and wondering about what are those, those presents under the tree. I actually didn't have to wonder that much because I usually, I was kind of a, a, a mischievous little kid and I had probably snuck around, poked a hole in a present, figured out what it was, but Looking forward to it. Now, one of the presents that I almost always got, and I knew it was coming, was a Tonka truck, okay? Any of you guys get Tonka trucks growing up? I'm not talking about those little plastic things they sell now. I'm talking about the metal Tonka truck, the kind, you know, the kind that would rip your finger off your hand. They actually advertise this truck by having an elephant step on it, okay? Those are the kind of Tonka trucks I got. And Christmas morning, wake up and have breakfast, and then family would come over, and we'd read the Christmas story together, and we'd open up our presents and then pray, play with our toys the rest of the day. I loved that season, that time of anticipation for Christmas and Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. But you know, when Jesus was born, there wasn't that kind of anticipation because it was a very, very dark time. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what is it like to lead into Christmas when, when maybe it's not the best season of life. Before we dive into that, would you guys pray with me this morning? Father, thank you so much that I get to uh, stand on this stage, and it's always incredibly humbling. Lord, I pray that today you will speak through me, or that these will be your words, and Lord, that people's lives will be changed and hearts encouraged. If you're here today, maybe you'll pray this prayer we pray every weekend. Lord, I'm here. I'm listening. Please speak to me. Maybe there's someone sitting next to you that you know or you don't know. Maybe you could pray this prayer for them. Father, I pray for this person that's on the row next to me. I pray that you'll speak to them whatever circumstances are going on in their lives. Lord, that they will feel your Holy Spirit just come alongside them. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, in the first century Israel, when Jesus was born, there wasn't anticipation. It was a very, very dark time. In fact, 63 years, approximately 63 years before Jesus was born, the Romans had taken over Israel, and they were now under foreign occupation. The Romans had set up a puppet king named Herod. In fact, he was named Herod the Great. Guess who named him Herod the Great? He named himself Herod the Great. I tried that at home. I went home and I said, Sherry, from now on, I shall be known as Jeff the Great. And she said, no, you shan't. And so I'm not. <laughs> and so he was Herod the Great, called himself that. He, he was an evil guy. Like, we're pretty sure he poisoned his own father so that he could take over power. And he, he was obsessed with building projects because he wanted things to last after he, he was gone. And so he built huge things all over Israel. He rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. The way he did that is he had slaves do all the building. And then to raise the money to pay for materials, he just raised taxes. So on top of the taxes they had to pay Rome, they had to pay Herod even more taxes. 
And if you couldn't afford to pay the taxes, then you became a slave and were put to work working on his projects. Not only that, the society was controlled by the Jewish religion, and it was very corrupt at the time. The chief priest was appointed by Rome. The regular priests were corrupted by money and all kinds of other things that went on. So it was a very corrupt society, a foreign occupation, an evil king. And then on top of that, the economic situation was really rough. It was a kind of an illustration of what economics looked like in first century um, Israel when Jesus was born. There was the rich and the poor. There was no middle class. And there was really no mecha- mechanism to move from poor to rich. At the top of the pyramid for the rich were the Ro- Romans, any Roman citizen. Priests were paid well and they were considered wealthy and honorable. And then there were the elders, the Sadducees, the landowners. To have wealth in, in, in ancient Israel was to own land. And I, found, I didn't realize this, but all of the land in Israel at that time was owned by about 70 families. So everyone else would be poor. And that's where Jesus' family was. You had the tenant farmers, the skilled laborers. That's where Jesus would have been. We know his father was a a, a blue-collar construction worker, so he had a, a job, he had a trade. Below that were the day laborers. And these were guys who would go to the market every morning and just hope that someone would hire them for the day. And they would earn enough money that day to buy that day's food. In fact, when Jesus prayed the Lord's Prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread He was talking about day laborers because that's what they would earn. Below that, of course, were the debt slaves. You couldn't afford to pay your taxes. You couldn't afford to pay what you owed, and so you went into slavery. And the system was set up that you could buy your way out of slavery, but you could never earn enough money to do that. So if you reach that point, you're probably going to be a slave for the rest of your life. So there's the rich and the poor, but outside of the economic system are the outcasts. This is people that are beggars, that are sick, that are mentally ill. This is prostitutes. Tax collectors actually were outside. Even though they had money, they were outcasts. That was their economic system. Interesting thing that Jesus and his ministry, these were his people. This is who he hung out with was the outcasts. And it drove the rich crazy because no one paid attention to them. It was a very tough economy. And not only that, They hadn't heard from God for 400 years. No prophetic word for 400 years. Imagine if God had not spoken since 1623. And that's how dark it was when Jesus was born. And they had no idea what was going to be next. They had no idea that a little baby named Jesus would be born in a tiny village in Bethlehem. They did not know he would grow up and start a movement that would one day change the world. They had no idea that he would sacrifice his own life on a cross and give access to eternal life to all of us. All they knew was that the world was dark and they were waiting on God to show up. Some of you today may find yourself feeling in a similar position <clears throat> here at Journey. Um, that, that Connect card on the back of it is a place for prayer requests, and we encourage you to write prayer requests and drop them, in the, drop them in the offering at the end. And then every month or every week as a staff, we get together and we read those prayer requests and we pray over them. And it's been overwhelming. This past week, we prayed through some of them, and the stack that I was praying through is people need jobs. People are in a tough financial situation, daunting health problems, struggling marriages, Blended families and all the challenges that go with that. Family members and friends far from God. Uncertain future. People that would say in this season, it's tough. It's dark. I know what that's like. I've walked through many seasons like that in life. I remember when I was in my 30s, my early 30s, I was working at a job that I I just hate it. I, I, I graduated from, or when I left college, I went to work as a youth pastor, which is what I thought God had called me to. And, and then I became a church planter at a little church in Texas. And, and through just not being mature and not knowing how to grow in my faith, I, I burned out as a pastor and I left. And I went and I got a job teaching um, computer software. And I was working at the Dow Chemical Plant in Freeport, Texas, teaching refinery workers how to use a computer. And so it was a single wide trailer, 
and a bunch of guys would come in in the morning and they were rough and, and, and language was rough and they would, they, uh, I'd teach them for a half a day, then they would leave and literally my job was to go around and empty out all the spit cups and then the next group would come in and I would teach them and that was my life, day after day, teaching these guys to use computers. And I thought, God, is this it? Like, is this what the rest of my life is going to be like? I remember four years ago in this season, standing beside my youngest grandson's crib in the NICU at Children's Hospital. He had had a tremendously awful birth, deprived of oxygen for seven minutes. The doctors gave us very little hope. The prognosis was bad. And I remember standing beside his crib and saying, God, my grandson, my daughter, like, you got to do something. A dark time waiting for God to show up. Just a few weeks ago, I sat in the emergency room at Sky Ridge, and one of my children was in the back with the doctors, and I just was praying, God, is she, is she going to be okay? Is she going to be okay? It's a dark time. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about what do you do in those moments when you're waiting on God, waiting for him to show up. We're going to look at a book in the New Testament called Hebrews, and we're not going to go through the whole book, but it's, a, it's an interesting book because it's the only one in the New Testament. We have no idea who wrote it. There's a lot of theories about different people, but we don't know who actually wrote the book. We also don't know who exactly the audience was. But here's what we do know from the context inside the letter is we know that the, whoever the audience was, they were going through a really tough time. They were being persecuted for their faith. They were, in fact, being thrown into prison. This was a very tough time. And to this audience, the writer said this in Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And I'm sure the readers, when they read that, said, yeah, that's awesome, the hope and, and the, 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 that we hold unswervingly to, but what do we do? Like, how do we do that? What do we do while we're waiting for God to show up? And so in the next chapter, the writer just lists a, a bunch of people from the Old Testament who had been in very dark times, who had spent their lives waiting for God to show up. And he showed how they were faithful and how they waited. And I'm sure the, writer, the, the readers said, that, that's encouraging, but what do we do? So in the 12th chapter of, of Hebrews, the writer stops and he goes, okay, to hold on to hope, to, do, to follow the pattern of these people in the Old Testament, here's some things that you do while you wait for God. Now, as we dive into this 12th chapter, I want you to think of this uh, more like a buffet. Like this isn't three steps to happiness or five keys to getting through it. That's not what I mean. But there are things that the writer gives that you might say in your circumstance today you might say, I need to hang on to that. You may not be in a dark time right now, but you've probably been one in the past and you may be one in the future. And so, like in a buffet where I like, I love buffets, I go, ooh, I love that and I love that and I love that and human beings shouldn't swallow that, that's horrible. <laughs> As you listen, just ask God, God, what is for me? So let's look at that first verse of Hebrews chapter 12 and the writer says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, that's all those people he listed in chapter 11, since we're surrounded by this big crowd to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Strip off every weight that slows us down. What he's saying is, is we need to avoid what is unhelpful. We need to avoid the things that while we're in a rough time, that don't help us move forward. So what do we avoid? Well, the first thing that he talks about, he, he lists the very first thing that we avoid. He says, avoid sin, avoid sin. Now, the writer is not saying that if you're going through a dark time, there's obvious sin in your life. He's not saying that your sin has caused the bad circumstances. In fact, for many or most of you, that's not the case. What he's saying is when you're walking through hard times, it's a good time to look at your own life and say, what sin is slowing me down? What sin is keeping me from experiencing all that God would like to do in my life? When I'm in a tough time, it's a great point for me. I stop in prayer 
And I go to God and I say, God, help me see what I don't see. Help me do what what the 12 steps call a ruthless inventory. Let me inventory my life. Show me what doesn't please you, what is not God's best in my life, and how can I strip it away? So if you're in tough times, don't say, oh, it's because of my sin. Say, this is a great time for me to get rid of any sin that will slow me down and make it harder. Another thing that I find when I'm in tough circumstances that, that, that is unhelpful is fear. And, and I deal with fear in this way, fear of what might happen, fear of what the worst circumstance could possibly be. Four years ago, when I'm standing by my grandson's crib and every day for a month I'm in a waiting room at Children's Hospital and don't know what's going to happen next, and the doctors are giving a very dark prognosis, and they're saying, what might happen now, what might happen in two years, what might happen in three years down the road. And my family is really researching a lot of that, and I understand that. I didn't research any of it. I didn't, I, I knew what the doctor said, but I didn't go on Google, I didn't go to WebMD, I didn't do any of that. Why? Because that kind of thing made me afraid. And I knew that my role was not his doctor, my role was not his dad, my role was his granddad. And his granddad, I had one job, and that was to love him. And I would love him no matter what the outcome of this circumstance was. And so I got rid of the fear and pushed the fear aside. Now, I want to give you a little more of the story. Not every story has a bow, but this is Copeland, my youngest grandson, a couple of weeks ago at my house. Yeah, you can ooh and ah. He is the cutest, smartest, funniest, sweetest little four-year-old you're ever going to meet. He's perfect. He has no effects from what happened at his birth. But fear wasn't helpful, so I avoided it. Another thing that is unhelpful is anger. When I'm in a tough time, I get angry. I get angry at other people. I get angry at God. I get angry at people not doing what I think they need to do. And and I'm not saying it's not legitimate. I'm not saying that, that there's not things, circumstances, people that you don't, that don't deserve your anger, what I'm saying is it's just not helpful. Anger doesn't help. And so we strip it away. We find ways to get rid of the anger. Another thing that I struggle with in hard times is criticism. And I just begin to criticize all the other people, the doctors or the caretakers or the people at work or my neighbor or my own family or the other person in the relationship. And I've become very critical And some of my criticism, again, might be legitimate, but it's not helpful. And then one more that I try to avoid when I'm walking through tough times is is negative people. Do you have any of those kind of people in your life, the kind of people that feel like they've been called to a ministry of bad news? Like, if something's going hard in your life, well, they have five things that are worse, and they have three friends that it got really horrible for them because of what happened. Do you have those people? Like, last Saturday... Because I'm old and clumsy, I fell, I, I fell on my face. And fortunately, my head stopped my fall, which saved the rest of my body. But I hurt my wrist some and my head a little bit. And so I was telling a friend about this. He's the same age I am in his 60s. And he said, well, did you know that if a 60-year-old man, someone in the, a man in his 60s falls, he is 50% more likely to die in the next year? <laughs> what kind of stat is that? And why did he think that would be helpful to me in the moment? So I said, Tim, you are dead to me. Like, <laughs> you know who the people are. When you're in a tough time, you, you avoid them because they're not what? They're not helpful. The writer in Hebrews goes on and says, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. What he's saying is stay in the race. Stay in the race. You know when it gets tough, it, it, it feels like, ah, oh, maybe I should just quit. Maybe I should hide. Maybe, maybe I should change jobs. Maybe I should just get out of the marriage. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should just move to another state. When the race is tough, it always seems like the best next step is to drop out. But it's almost always a terrible idea. Here's here's what I mean. Never make long-term decisions based on short-term stress. As rough as it is, it's probably not the time to make a long-term decision. 
when my wife and I were young, when we were first married, we were poor. Like, we were poor, poor. We didn't know we were poor, but we were poor. I was a youth pastor making a little youth pastor salary. She was going to college full-time, working part-time at the mall. And we had these two old cars that we had when we got married. And one of them broke down. It wasn't worth fixing. We needed another car. And a new car had just hit the market in America, and it was the cheapest car available that you could buy new. And I, I told my wife, we've got to go buy this car. And I was such a genius, I said, and we got to pay sticker price. Like, we got we. So we walked in, we said, how much? Could we give you more? Like, and then we, you know, and then we financed it for four years or five years, something like that. I have a picture of what it looked like. Some of you might recognize this car. It was a Yugo. A lot of you have never heard of a Yugo. Um, <clears throat> car and Driver magazine called the Yugo the worst car ever built in the world, okay? <laughs> Not making that up. At one point, the driver's side where you, the handle that opens the door broke off. The crank, you, there used to be cranks where you had to roll down the window. The crank for the window broke. The passenger side handle that opened the door broke off. The only way to get out of the car was to crawl across into the passenger seat, roll down the window, reach out, and open the door. That's this lovely car that I owned. I bought it for $4,200. I sold it two years later while I was still making payments for $400. I'm giving financial advice after church if you'd like to talk with me. Here's what I'm saying. When you're in a dark time, don't buy a Yugo, okay? It's not the time to make major decisions. I was getting my hair cut a couple of months ago, and the lady cut my hair said, hey, you got any plans this weekend? I said, yeah, actually we do. My wife and I are going to go out. We're celebrating our 41st wedding anniversary. And she said, oh, that's amazing. She said, what's the key to a long marriage? And without thinking, I just blurted out, don't leave. But then I thought about it, and it really is the key. And it's not a blanket statement for all time, everywhere. Every, there are circumstances where you leave. I get that. But what I'm saying is that in marriage, in relationships, in a lot of the things we face in life, the best advice I can give you is don't quit. Don't leave. Better times are coming. And that's what the writer is saying is stay in the race. The next thing the writer says is this. We do this, we stay in the race, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He says, and this is key. I told you it's a buffet. This is the main course. This part isn't pick and choose. If we're going through tough times, keep our eyes on Jesus. Another way of saying that is focus on what matters. Focus on what matters. Don't get so focused on your circumstances, the challenges, what might come next, all the things that weigh us down. Focus on what matters, on Jesus. When I was about 12 or 13, my dad built a fence in our backyard. And I've always loved working with my hands and trying to learn woodwork, that kind of thing. And so I asked, Dad, Dad, can I help? And he said, okay. So he had set all the posts and he had set all the cross rails. And he said, okay, I'm going to show you how to put the the, the fence planks on. And so he had a, a board that he would sit on a cross rail and then you'd line up the plank with the top of that board and then you'd nail it in. Then you'd move the guide board down and you'd put up the next plank, line it up with the guide board and nail it in. He said, okay, you got it? Yeah. He showed me, I showed him a couple. He said, okay, great. You got it. He went inside. I did a couple more planks and then I remembered I'm smarter than my father. And so <laughs> That guide thing was slowing me down, and so I quit using it. I just lined up each plank with the plank before, right? Because I know what I'm doing. I worked all the way across the backyard, stepped back to, igno uh, uh, to admire my work, and the top of the fence looked like Mr. Toad's wild ride. It was just up and down and up and down. Why? Because I stopped using the, gate, the guide. I got my eyes on the other things instead of the standard. The writer is saying, when you're going through a tough time, financial, relational, health, whatever it is, don't get your eyes focused on the thing. Get your fo return your eyes to Jesus. Why? Well, one, because Jesus has been through what you've been through. Jesus has faced relational challenges, his family rejecting him, not having any money, horrible pain. He's faced all those things. 
And here's what I know. He's not afraid about tomorrow. He's not. He's not worried about what's going to happen next or not happen next. And he's never going to leave you alone. Even in the hardest times, he's, he's there right beside you. I, I remember on a family vacation when I was a little guy, we went to New Mexico. We went to Carlsbad Caverns. It's a big cave system, and we went on a tour. They took us into this huge cavern, and they said, okay, we're going to turn out the lights. And as a little guy, I thought, no! They turned the lights out. I'm scared of the dark. You can't see your hand in front of your face. It's the blackest, deepest dark I've ever felt. And panic rose up inside of me until I felt the big hand of my dad just reach down on my shoulder. And you know, when he touched my shoulder, the lights didn't come on. I didn't stop being afraid of the dark. But his presence calmed me. The writer of the Hebrews is saying, keep your eyes on Jesus. The circumstances will be rough. There are times that you won't know what to do next, but he's with you. His presence calms us. The next thing that the writer says this is Hebrews uh, down in the 12th, 13th verse. He says, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. I love this. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. He says, mark out a straight path for your feet. Another way of saying that is make a plan. Make a plan. When you're going through tough times, think about, okay, how am I going to handle tomorrow, next week, next month? Make a plan for what is next. When I was uh, recently walking through something like this with a friend, and, and they were really struggling, really struggling with a mental health issue. And what I talked about is, hey, let's, don't, don't worry about next month, next week. Let's make a plan to get to noon. Let's just get to noon. And then we get to noon, let's talk. And then we talk at noon and we say, okay, let's get to three o'clock. Let's get to three o'clock. Sometimes it's that hard. Or maybe it's tomorrow or next week. For some, Christmas is going to be amazing. Christmas Day is going to be fun and family. And to for others, it's, it's tough. Blended families and people that just don't get along and hurt and all of that. Make a plan in advance. How am I going to have that conversation? How am I not going to get into that conversation? How am I going to get the energy that I need as a person to be able to be there present for my family on Christmas Day? I have a tiny illustration. It doesn't compare to yours. But I found out this week, and this is sad. My, my, I found out this week my children don't love me. My adult children don't love me. And here's how I know that is because they each individually decided to spend Christmas Day with the other sides of their family. Um, I don't know how that happened, right? My wife and I have been married, as I said, 41 years. This will be the first Christmas ever that we have spent just the two of us. We've never had Christmas, just no other family. My wife said, how do I feel? How do you feel about that? I said, bitter. That's how I feel, just bitter. <laughs> My wife made a plan. She said, okay, Christmas can be different this year. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this, and then we'll do this, and we'll do this. We're going to have fun. It's going to be a great day. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to the mountains, and we're not letting our kids come. So there you go. <laughs> of course, they'll both be in sunny places where it's warm, but that's okay. Obviously, you have bigger issues than that, but the idea is to make a plan ahead of time. How am I going to deal with what I'm facing over the next few days, weeks, months. The next thing the writer says is this, says, work at living in peace with everyone. Work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. The next verse says this, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out, listen to this, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. I want to talk about that bitterness for just a minute. There's a pastor that I have admired for a long time, worked for him for a little while, named uh, Pastor Rick Warren. And what he often said is that the trials that we go through can make us bitter or make us better. Sometimes the trials are actually what strengthen us, what make us stronger. And so the writer is saying, watch out for this bitterness. Don't get bitter, get better. How? Well, he says, look out for each other. In other words, take care of each other. When we're walking through tough times, when you're walking through tough times, here's what I know because I read the cards and I talk to people in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the atrium. The people sitting next to you are 
going through tough times too and your circumstances are different than theirs. But what if we just said, you know what? I'm not going to just focus on the challenges I have in my life. I'm not just going to think about my circumstance, my family. But I'm going to take care of other people. I'm going to find out how I can care for them. What if we just sent a text this week that just said, hey, I don't know what's going on in your life, but God brought your name to my mind, and I'm, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I have a group of guys who do that for me, and it's incredibly encouraging. Maybe we uh, pick up the phone and say, hey, we, why don't we grab coffee over this Christmas season, just hang out a little bit. You know, this is what church community is. This is, this is what it's about. Like, we gather here for three reasons. We gather to worship God. We gather here to hear God's word. But we gather here to have community, to take care of one another. One of the things I love about, about churches is when someone is in a tough time, people get together and they, they bring food to their house. We sit in small groups and we pray for one another. That's why we talk about uh, finding your group here at Journey all the time. When you come in January, we're going to talk again about groups are forming and find your group and find your group. Why? Because we need to take care of each other. You may not be in a tough circumstance right now, but maybe you've been one in, the, in one in the past and you can help somebody else. And you'll probably be, one in the fut- be in one in the future and they'll help you. So let's take care of each other. The chapter concludes with this verse. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. I love that verse. A kingdom circumstances can't shake. Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. The final couple of things that we do while we wait for God. The first thing, be hopeful. Be hopeful for tomorrow. Because God's kingdom is unshakable, because it doesn't change, we're receiving an unshakable kingdom, we can have hope. And here's the thing I know about while we wait for God, when God shows up, it's probably not going to look like what we thought it would look like. When I prayed for my grandson before he was born, I didn't expect to spend a month in the ICU. I didn't expect for him to have seizure after seizure after seizure. I didn't expect any of those things. But God showed up differently. When Israel was in the dark time under King Herod and really struggling, they didn't expect a little baby to be born in a tiny insignificant village to be the answer. I don't know what God is doing in your life. I don't know what is next. I know that his kingdom is unshakable. I know that he is with you. I know that he will answer. He always does. But it it is unlikely that it will look like what you had hoped it would look like. But eventually, it will be amazing. Let's have hope. And then, let's be thankful for today. Thankful for today. That is so hard. (laughs) It's so hard. When I wrote that down, I thought, yeah, that sounds great. How do we do that? Like when we are in tough circumstances, how can we be thankful? And then I remembered sitting one day up at uh, Children's Hospital, probably about two weeks into waiting to see if my grandson was going to survive, what was going to happen. And I just started to say, God, thank you for these doctors Thank you for these nurses. Thank you for this cooling process that someone came up with. Thank you for my friends that come and pray for me in the lobby, even though they can't come up and see the baby. Thank you. What can you thank God for in this moment, in this time? What can you say, you know what, rather than focusing on what could happen and what is happening and what is bad, I'm hopeful, God, that you show up And I'm thankful in this moment. Then the scripture that we read, that last scripture says, what's the last thing? We worship. We worship. We bring it to God. We say, God, here it is. Here's this thing that I can't handle, that I can't fix, that I don't know what's next. I I bring it to you. I, I leave it there. And I worship you. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I don't, I don't know what people are walking through today. Some, it's a great season, and we just, we worship you in that. We worship you in the beauty of this season. 
And some, it's dim. And for some, it's dark. But Lord, I know that you came for the outcast. You came for the hurting and the sick and the scared and the lost. And Lord, I pray in this moment that you will come beside us and come along next to us and that we will feel your presence as you continue the work that you're doing in our lives. Lord, I pray for everyone who is here, everyone who is at Highlands Ranch, everyone who is watching online, that they will find healing and hope in this season. Lord, we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.